The experimental boiling water reactor will begin producing electric power early in 1957 at the Argonne National Laboratory near Chicago. In the spring of 1955, Mr. John M. West, project manager, broke ground for the structure, culminating the intensive experimental planning and design work in progress since 1953. The reactor will be used to generate 5,000 kilowatts of electricity by a new method. Experience gained will be applied to the design of full-scale power plants that will someday serve entire communities. The EBWR itself will supply power for the laboratory. This film brings to you some of the construction features of this unique facility. Since more than half of the building is below grade level, the excavation had to be greater than 70 feet deep. The first layer of concrete for the base was poured in the bottom of the hole and construction of a huge steel shell was begun. Fabricated steel plates, 5 8 inch thick, were used for the below grade portion. First, a steel band was assembled near the bottom. Plates were then welded on to form an ellipsoid dish. 400 cubic yards of concrete were poured for support. The welding specifications were most rigorous, for the welds had to be pressure tight. The workers made more than 8,000 linear feet of such welds. Each precision formed plate was mounted in its designated place. Around the clock welding operations speeded the erection of the shell. The top of the shell is in the shape of a hemisphere, a more efficient shape for strength. The internal construction began with the laying of a bottom floor inside the shell. Tons upon tons of concrete were poured in, more than was required for strength alone. Enough weight had to be placed in this from being forced out of position by the buoyancy of groundwater in the event of saturating rains. Heavy reinforced concrete walls, two feet thick, serve as bearing walls and as retaining walls to keep the shell from being crushed by groundwater pressure. They also protect the steel shell from damage or puncture by accident or failure of the equipment during construction and operation. The concrete work included casting the four heavily reinforced floors plus supports for the machinery. An integral part of the structural concrete work was the construction of a shaft reaching from the base to the top floor. This is the outer part of the reactor shield. The massiveness of the steel shell structure is shown by this view from the base before the backfill was put in. The protrusion shown is a personnel airlock which will be at the ground floor level. Entry through an airlock assures that the shell is pressure tight at all times. When the concrete was cured, the earth backfill was moved in. The structure is designed to withstand an internal pressure of 15 pounds per square inch with a safety factor of four. Air pressure at 18 and three quarters pounds per square inch was maintained in the building for 10 days and not a single leak, a mark of fine workmanship. To permit entry of equipment and construction materials, a service door was cut in the shell. As a floor was finished, mountings were installed for heavy equipment, like the steam condenser and power generator. At this point in construction, installation of all the associated equipment to convert the power produced by the reactor to electricity began. The first piece of apparatus to go in was the steam condenser. Its dimensions determined the size of the access door. Inside, this and all other equipment in the high-pressure steam cycle are located at or below grade level. Construction of a control building proceeded concurrently with the installation of equipment in the shell. In preparation for the installation of the reactor container, massive steel supports were provided and lowered into the reactor shield column to rest on the base of the building. Additional sections were added to form supports reaching to the top floor. The frame for the reactor was completed with the installation of heavy cross members. The reactor vessel itself came next. 
It is important to note that this is the primary pressure vessel in which steam is generated by nuclear energy. A violent nuclear explosion, that is one like an A-bomb explosion, is impossible. It has been demonstrated that a boiling reactor has inherent safety characteristics which make a runaway nuclear reaction producing a steam or chemical explosion highly improbable. Nevertheless, extraordinary safety features were incorporated in the design to prevent the escape of radioactivity. For example, the two and one half inch thick walls of the vessel are stronger than necessary for the 600 pounds operating pressure. Then, as a final safety measure, the entire building is made airtight to contain all fission products in the event of the escape of radioactivity due to damage to any part of the steam generating system. This is the only reason for the pressure type building. Actually, during normal operation, there will be no significant air pressure inside the building. The vessel was mounted in the suspension supports and the required fittings attached. Electric cable pans were installed throughout the shell. Since the reactor and all other equipment in the shell are to be operated from the control building, it required pressure tight ports to run the 1200 cables through the shell to the control building. Normally no personnel will be inside the shell during operation except for the routine inspections during each eight hour shift. Water pipes connect the power system to the conventional cooling tower. It dissipates the excess heat generated by the reactor. Concurrently, the transformers and equipment for the electric substation were moved in. Heavy steel support frames were installed to hold the concrete ceiling inside the shell. Next, the rail beams for a 20-ton circular track crane were installed. Down in the reactor well, lead shielding and copper cooling coils were mounted around the vessel. Temporary trusses for the concrete ceiling were put in place. Plugs in the ceiling permit any excess pressure to be borne by the steel roof rather than the concrete. A 4.16 kilovolt turbine generator set was installed. Its capacity, 5,000 kilowatts. This is the average electrical requirement for argon and the power generated will be used to supply the site. A very special concrete was required for the biological shield, compounded to achieve high density rather than strength. This material was needed in order to provide sufficient mass to stop the gamma and neutron radiation that penetrates the reactor vessel and the lead shielding. The gamma rays are similar to energetic x-rays and are stopped by bulk alone. The neutrons are absorbed by iron and water. By using steel punchings instead of gravel and magnetite in place of sand, a concrete mixture that is about two and one-half times as heavy as ordinary concrete was obtained. This super-dense concrete fills the space between the octagonal shaft walls and the lead shield. The exterior of the shell was insulated with foam glass to minimize heat losses and to prevent unequal expansion which would cause thermal stresses in the steel shell and interfere with the operation of the circular track crane. With the installation of more of the primary associated equipment, the internal construction was nearly complete. Such equipment included a steam dryer emergency cooler, also a condenser and air ejector. Several pumps were included, this being the condensate feed water pump. A condenser cooling pump was also necessary. Future plans call for operation with a heavy water steam cycle. This requires the installation now of a special system to recover even trace amounts of any heavy water leakage. In order to prevent the inadvertent release of objectionable amounts of radioactivity, all liquid wastes are collected in retention tanks for monitoring prior to disposal. Control rod drive machinery for operating the reactor is located in a high narrow room in the shaft underneath the reactor. Control from beneath is one of the distinctive features of the EBWR. Pipe stubs for future operation with forced circulation are also provided. The capacity of the experimental boiling water reactor was established at 5,000 kilowatts to be large enough for practical engineering studies on boiling water power generation, yet small enough to avoid the heavy costs characteristic of very large power plants. 
In November 1956, Argonne National Laboratory and the AEC Chicago Operations Office, working together, reported construction nearly completed, advancing the Atomic Energy Commission's program of reactor development.